I'm uh, very, very excited um, to learn about India. Um, pleasure, and pleasure. I think, um, you know, we've got no, uh, you know, very much looking forward to the, to the insights, um, the rise of a new Indian elite. So without further ado, please, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks, Jasper. Thank you to uh, Asia Society for hosting us. This is a divinely beautiful venue. Now, I have to say that the only thing common between Mumbai and Tokyo at this time of the year is the rain. Right, so we also have our rainy season. Uh, if we were able to uh, see this much green in Mumbai, you'd have to be a multi-billionaire because uh, uh, property prices in Mumbai, I think, now rival uh, Tokyo. So, so to sit next to almost feels like a Zen garden and be addressing you over breakfast is a is a privilege. Uh, my name is Saurabh Mukherjee. Uh, I run a company called Marcellus Investment Managers, and our job in the next uh, 25 minutes, uh, uh, Leo has given us the timekeeping deadlines. In the next 25 minutes, <laughs> is to give you a our synopsis of what's happening in the world's uh, fifth largest economy and the world's fourth largest stock market now, right? Um, I'll give a quick introduction to my colleagues here, my colleague Pramod Gubbi, he's a fellow founder of Marcellus, and Achint is our man in America. Uh, we're also SEC regulated. Uh, I think one of the divine pleasures of working in stock markets, you get regulated by regulators all across the world, and they inflict the same pain on you in different ways and it sort of makes you, makes you stronger and fitter. Uh, we manage about a billion dollars, uh, both domestic money and uh, European and American institutional money. Uh, uh, it's an employee-owned firm. There's 24 of us uh, who've been doing this now for six years, right? Now, before I talk about India and how we invest in India, let me talk about Japan mm. and how Japan has invested in India. In the last decade or so, Japan has invested 25 billion dollars in India, right? There are hundreds of investments. Let me talk about the two most prominent Japanese investments in India, right? Uh, in uh, the largest car company in India, the car company which has 45% market share is owned by Suzuki. This company went public 20 years ago. Suzuki's listed entity in India went public 20 years ago. Since then, the share price has compounded at 23%. So that means it's up, I think, 70x in 20 years. Believe it or not, this company sells 45% of India's cars. That's 2.5 million cars a year. The entire world comes to India to sell cars. Every car maker of note operates in India, right? The Europeans are there, the Americans are there, now the Chinese are there, the Koreans are there. But Suzuki has 45% share, 2.5 million cars a year. This company's profits in the last decade are 1.1 trillion yen. Market cap in India is 8 trillion yen. Right, 23% compounded returns over 20 years, so 70x, um, and 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 you got leadership in the car market. That's the largest Japanese investment in, in India, 8 trillion yen company. The second largest Japanese investment in India is Honda, the two-wheeler leader. Honda sells 5 million two-wheelers in India every year. Honda's numbers are even more astonishing. Uh, till 17 years ago, Honda had a JV with an Indian partner. Then they went on their own 17 years ago. In the last 17 years, Honda's profits are up 140x in India. That's 30, I think 37%, 36% compounded. Um, number three is Sony. Sony also sells in excess of a billion yen of a billion uh, yen of uh, 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 material in India, music systems in India each year, right? Now the point I'm making is. This is not the exception. The exception in India is companies that make weaker returns. The norm in India has become that well-run companies, whether they be invested in by Japanese or Indians, well-run companies are making large amounts of money. The result of that is this chart. Right? As we, when we try to understand the Indian elite, mm. I think it's worth understanding the stock market. Over the last 10 and 20 years, we've largely given America a very good run for its money in terms of dollar returns. In terms of dollar returns over 20 years, India is the best performing market in the world. 13.1%, uh, America is 10. And over the last decade, India is one, uh, uh, sorry, America is one over the last decade. Uh, Taiwan, uh, primarily TSMC, I think. Taiwan is number two and India is number three. Interestingly, Japan is, I think, number four in the last decade, right? The fact that over 10, 20, and 30 years, uh, the two free market democracies in the world, the two largest free market democracies in the world have excelled in uh, driving double digit returns, I think are linked. What free market economies have is contestability of power, right? This is an important thing. Living in India, 
we can see political power is contested for very actively and economic power, the sort of economic power Japanese companies have, have been, has been contested for. But this contestability of power mm. is now creating a, a new elite in our country, right? So if I let me uh, get into that. Okay, before we get into that, once again, another demonstration of how much money is in India has made. So if a decade ago, say 2012, you'd invested $10,000 in India, and suppose you'd also done the same in China, your money would have doubled in India in dollar terms. In China, you would still be broadly at $10,000. Not only that, if a decade ago you'd invested in emerging markets, $10,000 in emerging markets, you'd still be where we were a decade ago. Emerging markets over 10 years have broadly given zero returns. India has doubled, more than doubled investors' money, right? Now, given that, given that we are the 140th poorest country in the world, right? we're the world's fifth largest economy, India is the world's fifth largest economy, but on per capita income, we're the 140th poorest nation in the world. Why is India able to make such large sums of money, whether it be for Suzuki, for Honda, or for the Indian stock market, right? I'll start with the simplest level of the answer, mm -hmm. and then we'll drill deeper. If you look at the uh, table on the bottom left, right, what we have done for you is looked across the emerging world. In the table on the bottom left, we've looked across the emerging world and said, over the last 20 years, how many companies has each large EM, how many companies has each large EM produced? Companies which have compounded revenues at 10% per annum with a return on equity of 10% for 10 years. 10% revenue growth, 10% return on equity over 10 years. Mm -hmm. India has 162 such companies. China has 126 such companies, right? Remember the Chinese economy is, is four times larger than the Indian economy. And yet, India has more consistent compounders than China. No other emerging market is remotely in the same ballpark. But the most stunning aspect of India's success is the chart on the right-hand side. If you were to take the 126 Chinese consistent compounders, remember this is the creme de la creme of China. The creme de la creme of China over 20 years is compounded at 10% in dollar terms. The corresponding metric for India is 26%, right? These companies are the engine of modern Indian success. Suzuki is in that list of 162. Honda is in that list of 162, right? And what we'll now get into is more exciting development. I'll skip the elections for later on if, uh, if somebody's interested. Let's focus on this aspect, right? Till, till about a decade ago, we had roughly 600 companies which were of the ilk of a Suzuki or a Honda. The, more ex the most exciting development of the last decade has been a rise of a broader swathe, around 6,000 companies. Right, Last decade, uh, we've used government, the Indian government's tax data, but the government of India's tax data is showing the black line is roughly 17% of India's companies, 17% of the companies in the entire country are growing profits at 15, 16% per annum on a decadal basis. And in fact, the last five year number, notice how the black line slopes, steeply slopes upwards in the last three years. Over the last three, four years, uh, profit compounding for the for the top 6,000 companies in India has now gone to 24, 25%. So there was a time when a Suzuki or a Honda was exceptional. And then we have only had, until a decade ago, we only had around 500, 600 such fast growing companies. Now we have 6,000 such companies, which over the last 10 years have grown profits at 15, 16%. Over the last three, four years have grown profits at 25%, right? Now, why is this happening? Why is this happening? Uh, I'm sorry, once again, I'll show you the same, same thing again. Uh, if you take Indian corporate tax data, the fastest growing decile, if you take Indian corporate tax data and you stack up the country in deciles, the fastest growing companies in India no longer are the top decile companies. It's the second decile, right? We call it the challenger class. And if you want to sort of put this in a management consultancy type two by two matrix, it's no longer the large companies, the rulers as we call them. It's no longer large 800 companies who are growing the fastest. The rulers still dominate profits. 60% of India's profits belong to the rulers. But it's the challengers, the around 5,000 or so challengers uh, around one one and a half percent of India's companies. The challengers now account for 25 percent of the profits. The challengers are growing significantly faster than the larger companies, right? So the, if the first uh, 20, 30 years of Indian capitalism was about incredibly well-run Japanese companies doing well, 
the last decade is about these smaller indian companies <laughs> coming through with rapid growth right now what's helping them right what's helping them let's move into uh, some discuss some of the drivers uh, i'll do a quick summary and then we'll elaborate upon these drivers in a little bit more detail in the next 10 minutes right we've managed to get three things three things right in the last decade or so the first is digital infrastructure 55% of indian gdp 55% of national income is now mobile commerce phone to phone payments we use something called upi unified payment interface so we as per visited mumbai and yes per wanted to have a cup of coffee in the local coffee shop he wouldn't be expected to pay in cash nobody pays cash anymore for coffee neither would he be expected to produce visa or mastercard even that is visa or mastercard are also passe he'd be expected to just hold his phone up on the qr code and the coffee shop will suck cash out of his phone the phone will be linked to yesper's bank account in japan even foreigners can do this now if you visit india your japanese bank account will get mapped onto your phone in india and when you have coffee or you take a taxi right you just have to hold your phone up to the qr code and cash gets sucked out of your phone zero transaction costs and from a small business perspective working capital cycles working capital cycles crunched dramatically right so so this has been our this has been a spine of our progress now not only is the coffee shop getting paid costlessly right he is not using visa or mastercard neither is he using cash not only is the small business getting paid costlessly the banking system can track every cup of coffee that that coffee vendor sells or track every uh, fruit or vegetable that the green grocer sells and as a result credit for the ness of that small coffee shop a credit worthiness of the green grocer transforms so the second thing that's happened in the last 3 4 years is small sme lending mm. sme lending is growing at 35% because lenders banks and non bank lenders are doing what we call cash flow financing they're seeing the cash flows of the coffee shop they're seeing that the coffee shop is selling cups of coffee to yesper to saurabh and they're saying this business generates a high velocity of revenue a high velocity of profits let's do cash flow financing right so for small businesses cost of working capital has dropped from 20% to 10% in the last 4 years which is one of the reasons the challenger class is coming through the third layer of what we managed to get right is uh a uh, uh, mobile mobile data we have the world's lowest mobile data costs mobile data in india costs 150th of what it does in america we use more mobile data than the whole of north america put together we use more mobile data than the entirety of the european union put together mm. right and that again <coughs> is proving to be a boon for small businesses so if you look at our business we are in that challenger class challenger companies profits tend to be between five and 50 million dollars right mm-hmm. marcelus is a challenger company most of our business in india comes via via video calls clients watch the zoom call or they watch youtube videos then they contact our team via email and the entire client sign up is done by a mobile mobile data right most people in india now uh, are, watch nobody watches physical tv anymore most people watch most of their tv programs on mobile uh, 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 the entire countries uh, tax system is on mobile data the fact that mobile commerce both in terms of payment and in terms of get uh, doing marketing online has become costless has ma- been a massive boon for smaller businesses right so those are the background forces this one other force uh, factor that i didn't couldn't capture graphically in 2017 we changed the tax system in india we are a federal structure much like america till 2017 each of our states had a separate tax structure in 2017 we scrapped that and moved to a unified national tax system so it gives gave small businesses a national canvas on which to operate a 3.5 trillion dollar national canvas rather than state level state level tiny economies right so you transform your digital infrastructure you transform your tax system lending to smaller businesses takes off and small challenger franchises roughly 5006 of 6000 of them start coming through it's a private equity investors dream come through right now let's turn this into the theme of today right the new elite who are the new elite right so there are five, five constituencies we're going to discuss we call it wesco the first is women 
right? Uh, against all odds, a decade ago, if you'd asked me that Indian women will make this sort of economic progress, I wouldn't have believed you. The data is coming through thick and fast. Indian women, Indian women's economic fortunes have been transformed in the last decade, right? We'll discuss uh, in, a, in, a, in a minute how much money Indian women are making. Secondly, a new class of educated people, no longer elite education, no longer Oxbridge style British or American education, no longer even Indian elite education, just local graduates from ordinary colleges. This is the new Indian elite. They are running the challenge of franchises, right? Thirdly, South India. Right. South India is the world's fastest growing region by a country mile. Highly educated, good law and order, uh, uh, developed infrastructure. And South India is, is basically the economic engine of India. I dare say soon it will be the economic engine for much of Asia. Right? Uh, we cannot thank the Chinese enough. Uh, uh, what's happened in China is a boon for us. Uh, we are getting business hand over fist because of the developments between China and, and America. We'll discuss that. And finally, uh, we've always been good at IT outsourcing. Mm. What we are seeing in the last decade is outsourcing of everything to India. Accounts, payroll, sales, marketing, HR, everything is going to India. We have, we, we have 1,600 of these global capability centers. There is one opening every day, right? One opening every day. Every day, a Western company is shifting the core mm. of its business to either Bangalore or Mumbai or to second tier, third tier cities. And it's no longer IT, it's the entirety of the white collar Western ecosystem going to India because there's simply the skill sets are no longer available at the, in the West, right? So I'll develop these things a little bit more. Let me start with women. By the way, these books uh, are, are written by my friends. They're very good books, so you can buy them on Amazon. The books you have left on the table for you guys are books written by us. So the books written by us expand on these themes. Uh, but these are, in a way, we, uh, you know, we, we have seen further than other men in India because we stood on the shoulders of giants. The giants whose shoulders we have stood on, we have referenced their books here. Right? So a decade ago, my friend wrote this book about the rise of Indian women. And he wrote this book because uh, 10 years ago was the first time when there were more girls in primary school than boys. So 10 years ago was the first time when there were more girls in primary school than boys. Today, at every level of the education system in India, primary school, middle school, high school, university, there are more girls than boys, more women than men, and the pass rates for women are far higher than the pass rates for, for men. Right? So this is hard data from the government of India. The second bit of data that we have is from the central bank. What we have from the central bank, this is the chart, is that in urban and metropolitan areas, mm. basically big cities, for the first time in Indian history, mm. in urban and metropolitan areas, women's bank accounts have more money than men bank accounts, male bank accounts. The chart we couldn't paste for lack of spaces, women also have more bank accounts than men. So women have more accounts than men and they have more money in those accounts than men, right? So these are two solid bits of data. Women are better educated and they have more money. The missing piece is the job market data. Mm. And the bits that we have suggest that women are getting the best jobs. And why are women getting the best jobs? Not just in white collar, but even in factories. Entire factories in India now are driven by women, right? 100% women run factories are increasingly coming through in our big manufacturing hubs. Uh, one of the reasons I think this is happening is 65% of Indian GDP is services, financial services, media, hospitality. Um, last we knew, uh, muscle plays no role, right? Brawn plays no role in services. And hence, if you're better educated, and those are usually women, they're getting the best jobs and services. Around 20% of our GDP is manufacturing, but much of our manufacturing is light industrial manufacturing. For example, pharmaceuticals, for example, my uh, iPhone made in India, right? This sort of job, again, muscle plays no role. So the entire 90% uh, of the iPhone staff in India, 90% of the outsourced contractors staff for Apple is women, right? So the shape, the shape of the Indian economy has very little heavy industrial component and that's lending itself, we think, very nicely towards, towards female employment, right? And, and we can see this Another way to see this is companies that focus on selling to women, their sales are roaring, right? The simplest one is Nestle. Nestle sells infant formula milk in India, two and a half billion dollars worth of it. It's, it's one of the rare FMCG companies where volume growth is 10%, 10% volume growth unfailingly every year, 
right? And similarly, you know, there's an apparel company called Westside. Uh, Westside uh, sells, uh, um, Westside has a JV with Zara, but Westside also has an affordable clothing line called Zudio. Zudio opens one 20,000 square feet store every day. Zudio opens one store, one 20,000 square feet store every day. They open 200 stores a year. They've done so for the last couple of years, and I think they can get to 2,500 stores in the next few years. Sales per square feet, sales per, sales per store, rise at around 20% each year, right? The customers of Zudio are primarily women. The customers of Westside are primarily women, right? So, so if women are doing well, naturally companies that cater to women, to Indian women are, are absolutely thriving, right? Um, now, let's go to the next theme, right? The new elite, a big part of this is education. Till about a decade, I migrated to India. I migrated to India in 2008. I grew up in the UK. I migrated to India in 2008. The India I migrated to was very much about um, which university did you go to? Did you go to Oxbridge? If not that, did you go to Yale? Uh, I went to LSE. That was all right. I just got got by, <laughs> right? And if you didn't go abroad, did you go to the IITs and the IIMs? It was really important. 15 years ago, it was really important to have elite education. Right? And if you looked at the composition of, of Indian boardrooms, right? so if you take India's top 50 listed companies and you looked at where the board directors mm. came from, till a decade ago, the board directors were elite educated. IIT, IIM, Ivy League, Oxbridge. Right? If you take the latest data, the latest data on Indian boardroom composition for the first time in Indian history, if you see that final bar, the FI23 bar, for the first time in Indian history, the majority of board directors in India are not elite educated. They are regular local graduates from local universities, right? And I think this is a big change, right? Uh, if you guys are interested, this is an outstanding book. It was written in 2008. This is actually one of the books, this is one of the books which prompted me to migrate to India, India's new capitalists. And uh, this gentleman, Harish Damodaran, preempted this. He wrote, he wrote about this in 2008. Mm -hmm. He said that the established elite will be overthrown because the scale of opportunities are so big that a few elite universities won't be able to feed an economy growing at 7-8% a year, right? And the result of that is, let's take, let me focus on India's largest bank. HDFC Bank was created in 1995. It was created in 1995. Today, it is twice the size of Citigroup. It's twice the size of Citigroup. It's compounded shareholders', shareholders wealth over 29 years at 35%. It's $150 billion market cap. Not a single board director mm. has elite education. They all went to a very famous university. It's called the University of Mumbai, right? Till five years ago, nobody would have made too much of it, but increasingly we are seeing this, this is becoming a hallmark. Venture capitalists in India, my friends who are VCs, now specifically look for people without elite education. Because their point is someone who's elite educated has a mindset which focuses on, on, est, uh, on success within a structured framework. Whereas to succeed in India, you need to have a, a mindset which thrives in taking on open-ended challenges, right? Very different uh, mindset. You know, wh what lang you know, whether I speak the Queen's English or not, no longer matters in India. Which club I drink gin and tonic at also no longer matters. Do I understand technology? Can I manage multicultural teams of people? Am I an entrepreneur? Those have become critical qualifications to make it to the new Indian elite, right? Now let's go to South India. Um, so, so by South India, we mean Peninsular India. As you know, we are the world's largest peninsula. Peninsular India, basically Maharashtra, Karnataka, Tamil Nadu, Andhra, Telangana, Kerala. Peninsular India has a quarter of the country's population, half the GDP, and 60% of the growth. Quarter of the population, half the GDP, and 60% of the country's growth. Mm -hmm. Peninsular India is growing at 8 to 9% per annum. This is the world's fastest growing region. Right? This is where Bangalore is, this is where Chennai is, this is where Hyderabad, these, these cities are growing, these cities are doubling every six years or so, right? Now, why, why Peninsular India is pulling away from the rest of India is a deep question. Uh, I won't be able to give you a definitive answer, even if you give me an audience, it's a very tough question to answer. Why is the south of India pulling away so rapidly from the north? But the practical implication is we as investors mm. have to over-index the south. 
we have to over index the south because we have to look for companies who are setting up factories and building up customer bases so if you look at the company on the top asian paints this company has 50 percent of our paint market this company has compounded 24,000 x in the last 40 years 10 x in 10 years 100 x in 20 years 1000x in 30 years and 24,000x in 40 years. This company sells paint through 150,000 shops. The majority of the shops are in southern India and they're expanding rapidly over there. It's a politically touchy subject, so nobody wants to come on you know, broadcast media and say that they're over-indexing the south. And therefore, we as investors have to, have to do a bit of work to figure out which companies are over-indexed in South India, right? So if you get a chance, visit visit Southern India, you'll see basically the, both the future of India and I suspect the future of, of Asia as well, right? Incredible mm -hmm. progress in a in a tight part of the country, right? Then we come to China, the China plus one opportunity. This is actually closely linked to the previous topic, the rise of South India. Uh, I'm not going to get into the details of what's happening between China and America. I think many people in this room understand the subject better than I do. Right? Let me quickly focus on the opportunities it is creating. Mm. There are broadly three areas where it's creating opportunities. From. The, every, the obvious one is, is phones, right? Um, Apple makes $200 billion of iPhones. Till three years ago, India used to make $2 billion of iPhones. Today, India makes $22 billion of iPhones. If Apple moves even a quarter of their production to India, India will make $50 billion of iPhones, right? As soon as you start making phones, even if you only make 30% hmm. of the phone, assume that the chip will still come from Taiwan, the digital display will come from somewhere else. So this, this is an Indian iPhone. So this metal casing is made in India, right? This metal casing is called metal injection molding. You basically take steel powder and you mold it to the shape of the iPhone, right? So this is done by a company outside Bangalore called Indo MIM, Indo Metal Injection Molding, right? Now, this technology is hard. And as, as Indo, Indo MIM, I think, will go public in the next couple of years. As Indo MIM becomes a larger and larger supplier to to, to Apple in India, as Apple's own production in India grows, as they de-emphasize China, I think firms like Indo MIM will be able to do way more things with what is very special technology. Already, they've got contracts to basically supply the same technology, metal injection molding, for rifles in America, right? So the rise of the iPhone ecosystem, and I think Apple said two days ago, they're also gonna make iPads in India. The rise of this whole supply chain, mm -hmm. going into phones and pads, will have other spin-off benefits. Uh, I'm assuming a 50 to 100 billion opportunity. The second opportunity is, is active pharmaceutical ingredients. Mm. China makes 80% of the world's active pharmaceutical ingredients. India makes only 10%. Right? The remaining 10% is spread across the world. Uh, for obvious reasons, American pharma companies are being told by the US regulator to reduce their dependence on China. Right? The natural place they are coming to is India. And we have invested in that whole supply chain, Divi's Lab. Divi's Lab is the largest manufacturer of naproxen in the world, 80% of the painkillers in the world. Four out of five painkillers you would have had in your life. The API comes from Divi's Lab. Half the cough syrup in the world, the API comes from Divi's Lab. Um, half the sartans in the world, blood thinners, the API mm -hmm. comes from Divi's Lab. It's largest in India, fifth largest in the world. Wuxi, Wuxi is the second largest in the world. Wuxi is a Chinese company. It's been in the news for some uh, uh, unusual reasons over the last few months. And I reckon a lot of that business will come to India. Now, this is an opportunity and a challenge. China makes $100 billion of API, roughly, roughly. Even if we take 10% of API share from China, our API industry will double in the next three years. That poses huge environmental challenges. Mm. It poses challenges in terms of land, capital. I don't have an easy answer about can we uh, deal with the environmental uh, fallout of making chemicals at that scale, right? But the opportunity is clear. Uh, the companies are lining up. So, for example, if you want to make APIs, you need intermediates. Intermediates is the raw material going into API. We've inv invested in that. And if you want to make all of these chemicals, you need ceramic glass reactors. Basically, your coffee cup, but from the ceiling to the floor. And that's the container in which ceramic reactors are made. This Indian company makes 55% of the world. GMM Fodler makes 55% of the world's ceramic glass reactors. Um, and we've invested in that as well uh, several years ago. Uh, as you can make out from the name, this is an Indian company which went to Germany and bought the world leader. 
right? So colossal opportunity. The third area is medical devices. It's a four hundred billion dollar global industry. Two hundred billion is made in in, uh, in China. India makes two billion medical devices. India just makes two billion. China makes two hundred billion, right? ECGs, X-ray machines, catheters, uh, cannulas, and so on. Again, I think straightforward opportunity. The West will want to. The West will want to reduce its dependence on China for critical medical equipment. One of the obvious places to come to will be India. So, if you just focus on three industries, just three industries alone, that's a three hundred billion dollar opportunity for India. Bulk of this is coming to Peninsular India, right? You need technology for this. You need good manufacturing facilities. You need law and order. You need infrastructure. Peninsular India is providing that. And lastly, the the global capability center boom, right? I have to confess, even this, even we who live in India have been taken, uh, taken by by surprise by this, right? So we'd all read "World Is Flat" by Tom Friedman. He published this 20 years ago, and Tom Friedman foresaw the rise of Indian IT services, right? Credit to the man, he foresaw the rise of IT services. What's happened is because of the skill shortages in Europe and America after COVID. Because of the skill shortages, there's been a mad rush by European and American companies to basically move all white collar jobs to India, right? So if you think about yourself, think about yourself. Say you're a airline, say you're Virgin Atlantic or British Airways. Do you really want to have accounts, payroll, HR, sales, marketing in you know a small town in England, say Swindon? Right? Will that be a competitive advantage for you to have your, you know, accounts and payroll and your HR and your sales marketing in a small town in England and struggle for talent? Because everybody who's got talent in the UK or America will either want to work on Wall Street or the City of London, or in Silicon Valley. Right? So you're struggling for talent, or would you would you want to stand up? You're a CEO of a Western airline. You'd rather stand up and tell the stock market, "I've turned fixed costs into variable costs, and I've outsourced it to India to TCS, or I've set up my own facility in a second-tier India Indian town where uh, talent is available, infrastructure is cheap, airline connectivity is good, mobile data is available, and so on." So that's what's happening. Uh, uh, we had so many names to cram in that I'm sorry, the logos are a little small, but it's a veritable uh, a rush to get into India to set up these global. Capability centers, 1,600 are already in place. As I said, one is opening every day, and they're no longer opening just in Mumbai and and Bangalore and Delhi. They're going to second tier, third tier cities because the infra, the the traffic issues and the cost of living issues are are better there. Uh, we've set up uh, our airline traffic in India has gone up 5x in the last decade. I think in the last 10 years, Pramod, we've built how many airports? We've built 250 airports in the last last decade, and I think on that subject, if you if there, if not for anything else, visit India to see what modern airports are like. Your airports are all right, better than America's, but your airports are not cutting edge. If you want to see cutting edge airports, visit India, and you'll see you don't have to stand in queues, you don't have to put out you know pieces of paper. You just show your face, camera, 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 and you get on the plane in 10 minutes, right? <laughs> and this is true for even. Airports in small town India. There is no human interaction involved. It's all automated. So that's the rise, rise of modern India. Just to give you, let's finish off on this opportunity. The services economies, the services economy, the service component of the of the Western economies. So Japan included, West plus Japan. The service sector GDP is fifteen trillion dollars. Right? Service sector GDP in the Western world is fifteen trillion dollars. Assume only 10% of that gets outsourced to India. That's $1.5 trillion. India's current IT and outsourcing industry is $300 billion. I reckon this goes 5x in the next decade. And again, the challenge will not be uh, business coming into India. The challenge will be talent, land, and the, the sheer pressure on on metropolitan metropolitan infrastructure. So that's the rise of modern India. Thank you very much, Jasper. Th thank you very much, uh, Asia Society, for giving us this opportunity. Thank you. Wow, fa fantastic! I, I feel almost like I'm, I'm inside, you know, one of the sort of Star Trek you know, when they visit <laughs> a different planet. Um, you know, there's uh, obviously a lot of excitement, a lot of things. Now, um, you know. For 30 seconds, what can go wrong? What worries you? I mean, there's obviously, yeah. you know, you mentioned a little bit some of the pressure points, you know, on the environment, on infrastructure, but what worries you um, about potential bottlenecks and structural impediments? So I think there are two interrelated issues which are pretty tricky, which are going to be big, uh, challenging for us. One is 
uh, we are a high tech country but because we are a high tech country we are automating um, very early in our economic development process right we are the 140th poorest country in the world and yet as i mentioned you visit our airports they are incredibly high tech right so so we need to create jobs for people mm-hmm. but because technology is so cheap and we have so many clever people deploying technology our banking system our it services industry our hospitality industry is automating using ai factories are getting robotized and uh, and i worry about that i worry about the fact that because technology is so easily available we are basically moving uh, we are getting rid of people and automating very early in our development so for example the indian it services industry is the world's largest right but it shed it shed 100000 people in the last 12 months mm-hmm. right because the it services companies are saying we'll shift to ai and make more money right we'll do the same amount of work but with fewer people mm-hmm. so this is a challenge and then the broader issue right our workforce is 500 million people mm-hmm. at the moment we only have have 200 million and if you are very sort of charitable and say you're in you're you know you're in a position of power you'll say 300 million jobs we have somewhere between 200 to 300 million people primarily in northern and eastern indian in india young people with uh, no jobs no skills mm. now the current solution the sort of political fudge is to give these people doles right so you give them uh, food subsidies you give them a national employment guarantee you give them subsidized health insurance and and you know, because the country is growing at 8% and tax collections growing at 14% roughly 80 billion dollar bill the country has a 80 billion dollar bill to look after these mm. these uh, 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 unemployed people uh, so financially it's doable mm. but there is a human cost mm. and as the rest of the country gets richer and on social media the youngsters can see unemployed youngsters can see how the rest of the country is pulling away i worry about social problems so mm. so it's a linked issue one is uh, lack of skilling mm. and the other is the rise of low cost automation um and you know people like us who uh, who live there we're sort of urging the government to use ai use robotization to create jobs rather than to get rid of jobs but i think it's a it's a very tough policy issue which is yet to be resolved I, I, if i was you know if i was kind to india i would say i don't think any country has resolved it this whole uh, mechanization and automation of jobs but no other country has 200 300 million people yeah. waiting to be employed this this is the core of our challenge i mean it's interesting if you just cursory sort of look at economic history actually india follows a development model that we've never seen before um normally you go from agriculture from the primary sector yeah. to manufacturing and then you go from manufacturing to the service sector and india skip that bit right i mean there is really you know no manufacturing business in fact that's at the macroeconomic level as you know very well your balance of payments mm. um you know is constantly in deficit or in threat of being in deficit right because so much of the what is called white goods and brown goods right a lot of it actually has to be imported mm. you know um let me um sort of you know sort of skip a little bit into you know so then why is there no large scale manufacturing right if you ask the people i'd love yeah. to ask you you know why is yeah. that the case the answer yeah. i get is uh, because the infrastructure doesn't work because yeah. physical supply of various components what the japanese have mastered the just in time inventory system in india basically is impossible because for all intents and purposes neither the roads nor the ports work Yeah so again if it's worth stepping back we are the only country on the history of this planet the only country to become a democracy <laughs> way before we became we became rich so at independence we were a universal adult <laughs> suffrage right 1947 we were born a democratic country now what that does and and there are probably three reasons to why we struggle to compete is our minimum wages are pretty high for a low income country we are the 140th mm. poorest nation in the world but our minimum wages are 3x that of bangladesh Hmm. right so most of the shirts we wear in india the shirts we wear in india are made in bangladesh because the labor there is one third the cost and operates in I conditions know. which in india will not be acceptable hmm. because in india worker rights hmm. are far better developed because it's a universal adult a uh, universal adult suffrage franchise right so the first issue is yep. your worker rights are high so your minimum wages are high second because uh, 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 to build 
uh, rapid infrastructure development, you need to go over farmlands, right? Mm -hmm. We are one of the most fertile countries in the world. Mm -hmm. And the farmers are saying, why should I give up my mm -hmm. farmland? Unless the government gives me a massive handout, that right? getting farmland has historically been tough. That being said, in the last 10 years, we have doubled the highway network. In the last 20 years, we've tripled the highway network. Mm. But compared to, say, a China, mm. it's hard to go and I mean, forget farmland. Even in cities, it's hard to slam a metro through the city because people will say, you dare destroy our house, we'll vote against you, right? So being a democracy at a low-income stage, no other countries had to deal with it. So second is infrastructure build-out mm. has been tough. And third is, um, historically, um, cost of capital has been high. So even today, an SME in India, I told you 10% is the cost of working capital finance for an SME. Mm. Working capital finance, I think China is 2 or 3%, so, right? So mm. yes, China's wages are high, but say Vietnam's wages are lower than India. Mm. I don't know land prices in Vietnam, but I suspect land prices in Vietnam will be cheaper. And I suspect the cost of working capital will be lower in Vietnam. And hence, anything which employ, which is labor intensive uh, or capital intensive yeah. manufacturing, we can't compete. Neither labor intensive nor capital intensive. Our sweet spot is manufacturing like pharmaceuticals, which is basically intellectual property mm. slammed into a tablet. IT services obviously is brains. So anything which requires brains, we can cut it, right? <laughs> but that's good for the elite. But what do you do for for workers who are, you know, school school graduates or not even that. Mm. Basically, workers who have basic level of rudimentary yep. skills, how do you employ them without mass manufacturing? But how do you get mass manufacturing if your cost of working capital is 2x, 3x that of, uh, of Vietnam uh, and your land costs are higher than Vietnam and your labor costs are higher? So the government's launched something which has worked uh, for mobile phones. It's called production-linked incentive. So Apple, for instance, gets a PLI. So I think it's 2% of the value of the phones that they make. Apple gets a subsidy of 2% of the value of the phones. That lowers the cost gap between India and Vietnam. Um, so it's worked for them in phones. It's the production linked incentives actually have been very successful in mobile phones. It's not yet been successful in things like shoes, uh, clothes, but that's something they're trying to crack. My suggestion to them would be, uh, to our government, and we've written about it, is lower the corporate tax rate from 25% to 20 percent. America is 15. I think China is 20. Uh, if we lower the corporate tax rate from 25 to 20, I think we'll be able to close some of the, mm. the cost gap between us and Southeast Asia. Um, it's not relevant in things like global capability centers because we're in a class of one there. There's no other country which produces 10 million graduates a year. India produces 10 million graduates a year. Mm -hmm. No other country can match us. But for employing large numbers yeah. in factories, there's a lot of work to be done. Mm -hmm. Does India do sort of, you know, China's uh, rise, a lot of focus on sort of special economic zones and, you know, as a result of that preferential tax rate, does India operate like that or is it really pinpoint? So, uh, we did a version of special economic zones for IT services. Yeah. Those were spectacularly successful. In fact, they were so successful that we no longer need yeah. special economic zones for IT services. We've, we've done special economic zones for manufacturing, but they've not been as successful. So, giving tax exemption has not been as successful. So, this latest strategy is the production-linked incentive, which has worked really, really well in mobile phones. And I think the, uh, our next union budget is on 23rd. July, I suspect we will get an expansion of the production linked incentives, where if you make $100 worth of stuff, you get a $2, $2 payment from the government yeah. to basically bridge the, the fact that our factor costs are, are very high for what is still a very poor country. Right. Uh, it's very interesting, with rise of global capability centers there, I don't think that there is a Japanese company in there. Uh, I think, Rak I thought I saw Rakuten in there. Rakuten, Rakuten is yeah. um, politely what? MUFG. MUFG. Okay. Well. Okay. Okay. No. So. So. Uh, I, I live in a suburb of Mumbai. So Nomura's GCC is uh, 100 meters from my house, and and we've actually very uh, we benefited from hiring from Nomura's GCC. They're very good people who work there, and our head of IT came mm -hmm. from Nomura's Global Capability Center. Mm -hmm. Right. So. So this. So uh, this aspect, I think, will be in a class of our own. If you ask me, in GCC in making knowledge intensive manufactured products like like electronics and like pharmaceuticals will pull away 
right? But can we make uh, fans and jackets and uh, sports shoes? I think, and I think, I think you guys know the answer. Uh, we'll have to come back a couple of years hence if you're going to prove me wrong on that. So far, it's been tough for us to make those basic things that sort of propel China and Vietnam's rise or even Bangladesh's rise. Bangladesh exports more textiles than India, mm -hmm. right? It's a country one thirtieth our size and they export more textiles than India because their minimum, labor, uh, minimum wages are one third that of, of India's. I'd like to open it up for the, for the floor. Yes. Johnny. Historically, India has uh, better and more friendly relations with Russia than with China. And uh, now Modi is playing again the Russian card. And do you see this having any significance or is token diplomacy? Yeah. So look, I mean, I'm, I'm not an expert in geopolitics, but what I can, what, what I see from a distance and, and we manage money for part of the, uh, we manage the pension money for part of the armed forces. Uh, so whatever they, little they tell us is this is what we make of it. Um, India, given China's uh, aggression, India has sought to build its military capability. So, for example, we need way more fighter jets than we currently have. I would say we're probably 200, 300 fighter jets short of what we currently have. Um, and India's consistent request to America has been give us you know, F-35s give us uh, uh, good fighter jets, and America has refused. Now, to give credit to Russia, they have given us whatever they have, uh, the MiGs and whatever they have, they've been willing to supply us the weaponry that we need. You might say, even we might say that the Russian weaponry is not cutting edge, but it's better than what uh, the West has been willing to give us. From what I understand, the current sort of standoff is as follows with America. America is saying, if you want our cutting edge weaponry, then sign a NATO type pact with us. Sign a NATO type pact with us. Um, uh, for reasons I, I, I understand, and I'm sure you might understand, you'll understand as well, India is unwilling to sign a, a NATO style pact with America. So that's where the kind of situation stands. Russia has been India's main arms supplier. Um, they've also given us cheap crude, as you, as I'm sure you've read in the last couple of years. Uh, the cheap crude is useful, but what's even more useful is the weaponry, uh, because we need that weaponry to deal with uh, China's, both China's mass of weaponry and also the fact that Chinese uh, military is very sophisticated weaponry. Um, America is hardballing us, perhaps that's the way they should be playing this, but uh, our response is, well, if you don't want to give it, give it to us, we'll take it from the Russians. Uh, two questions. First, why is cost of capital high in India? You talked about the efficiency of the financial system and yeah. huge growth of banks. What What's going on there? The second thing is sort of a broader question. Uh, my, my contacts with India start like 50 years ago, right. and it was a class society very much. Now you have a new class yeah. of, a new of, class of people yeah. e emerging. Can the new class make a better environment for class relationships in India, or is it going to be a continuation of, of the uh, class caste conflict that you've seen historic? So, so the caste equations, the old caste-driven hierarchy, I wouldn't say has been entirely overthrown, but it has been challenged. So for example, if you look at the educational data, uh, as I said, women are doing better than men, but what's fascinating is within women, uh, women from less privileged castes are absolutely blasting through the roof, right? Education attainment for women from less privileged castes is, is going through the roof. Similarly, in wage data, in wage data that we have access to, uh, in the blue collar wage, in the blue collar job market, there is no caste driven wage differential left, right? In, in the blue collar job market, people are getting paid regardless of caste. In the white collar job market, there are still there, are, there is still a caste issue, um, but a growing number of entrepreneurs are from the less privileged caste, much like America did with affirmative action. Half are university seats, half the jobs in government offices, and a significant slug of seats in parliament are reserved for less privileged caste. I'm not an expert on whether that's delivered all the results it should have, but the data I can see on education and on, and on wages suggests that there's been significant progress in that. Now, you're right in saying that, that this, this potentially triggers a change in caste relations. So 
This is how I've seen it. A big part of what we are seeing at the moment, if you leave the economics aside, a big part of the social churn we are seeing, right? This kind of desire to reclaim some ancient glory of the past, I think is driven by challenges to the established order. Women are challenging the established mm -hmm. order. Um, uh, uh, less privileged castes are challenging the established order, right? This has many dimensions to it. So for example, less privileged castes couldn't grow moustaches till when, when the caste system was in full cry. Now they, they are growing moustaches, they're wearing clothes like the more privileged castes. They're uh, coming to weddings and horses, which is a symbol of prestige. So the, the challenge to the established order is coming thick and fast. And I think some of the conservatism that we are seeing, um, mm -hmm. I think is a reaction to the established order getting challenged by uh, by sections of society who were formerly suppressed, right? Uh, it makes for a very um, uh, uh, interesting country to live in, but as you are, I think, alluding to, from outside it doesn't look very pretty. As someone who's living there, I kind of, I, I, I can't tell you how much I'm enjoying this. I saw the old India, and I would much rather prefer this, where people are pushing upwards and saying, I really don't care that you're upper caste and you went to elite education. I think I'm better than you. I'm going to push you aside and I'm going to claim my place in the world. Um, so, yeah, so, that, so, so we are seeing, uh, by the way, on this, if you guys want to read more about this, I think by far the best book written on India is a book called India, A Million Mutinies Now by uh, Nobel laureate V.S. Naipaul. Right? He wrote that book in 89. I read it when I was in high school. And if you read that book, it feels he wrote it yesterday morning. Mm. India, a million mutinies. Now, he captured this 40 years ago, that mm. this country, nobody's going to sit back. Mm. Nobody in there sitting back and saying, I now accept my place in the world. This is where God asked me to sit. Everybody's saying, I'm going to push upwards. And I don't care who you are. If you block my way, I'm going to push you aside and therefore you're getting a conservative blowback. You're getting a conservative blowback to that. Um, on your cost of capital at, at a superficial level, let me just give you the superficial answer. Uh, uh, total government debt to GDP is 80%, right? The, the uh, existing mass of government debt to GDP is 80%. Uh, the budget deficit, hmm. center plus states added up is I think 12, 13% of GDP. Hmm. So basically the government is is uh, the government borrows and drags up the 10-year bond deal. The 10-year bond deal is at 7%. And in a way, that sets the floor on the cost of capital. Now, if we did a China and we jammed the capital account, if we jammed the capital account, we could then say, tell the local banking system, give working capital at 3%. But we haven't done that. We have capital account convertibility. Hmm. By keeping capital account convertibility with a high government borrowing means that our banking system charges a 3% plus the 10-year bond deal, 10% for working capital. Now, should India jam capital account convertibility? I hope that, I mean, hope India doesn't do that, right? So, so that's the, so we are a free market democracy. The free market part also poses a constraint because money is coming across and going out uh, through, uh, through uh, going in and out. We have to give a spread over the 10-year bond deal to the banking system. Otherwise, money will leave the country. You could push back and say, well, why isn't supply of savings higher? In the last five years, it stepped up. In the last five years, domestic savings to the tune of $150 billion is coming into the system every year. This is the highest we've ever seen. Uh, people are saving less through physical, gold and real estate, more through financial. But we've got a long way to go. I reckon India's physical savings are around $9 trillion dollars, household balance sheet. $9 trillion is physical and only $1 trillion is financial. Right, so India's household balance sheet is around 10 trillion. 90% is physical, 10% is financial. As we toggle from physical to financial, I think we'll be able to get the supply up and that thereby push down the 10-year the bond deal and thus the cost of working capital. But that's going to be a, a gradual process. On, on that, while we're so technical on finance, of the capital market, of the, of the equity market's ownership, how much is uh, global, how much is domestic? Yeah, so so uh, the the owners of companies own 55% of the stock market. So mm. if I'm the founder, the founders own 55% of the stock market. Domestic financial institutions own another 15%. So that's uh, up to 70. Uh, and uh, domestic investors own around 10%. That's 80. Foreign investors own around 20%. Right. Okay. And so the owner class effectively is stuck, right? That's not free float. Uh, no. So they are gradually, it's interesting that you mentioned it, they are gradually selling down. 
So, so if you look at the uh, US, the elite is leaving. Right. Uh, so the elite is encashing. <laughs> the elite is partly encashing because the the children of the elite sure. are saying uh, life in London is very good, and you know, isn't Dubai a lovely place, right? So it's very interesting. The children of the elite are getting the mom and dad to flog the shares because if they want to compete in India, they're competing with people who are hungry, you know, ten notches less privileged. Mm. who are just brutally hungry they'll put in 80 hour weeks right yeah. and you know if you've gone to ivy league and you know you come back and you have ideas about work life balance and all that it's not going to work out for you in india and you can do as much work life balance. sorry but there's just a, a, you know inheritance tax and gift taxes uh, so so far uh, we haven't got it uh, i hope the government doesn't impose it we were hearing about japan's inheritance tax uh, uh, we don't have inheritance tax so far touch wood yeah, on that, just for 30 seconds, for your own education, the reason Japan has the inheritance tax is because of the Americans. Okay. Uh, we had eight families controlling 80% of the Japanese economy, I see. Uh, the Zaibatsu families, okay. and the Americans democratized that. Okay. They designed a tax system that ensured that that would never happen again as a result of I that. I know that. You know, Thank all you. family wealth is wiped out wow, over that's two a, generations. That's a novel way to democratize wealth. That's a novel way to democratize wealth. I hadn't thought of that. Yeah, remember Japan was there. Um, you know, Japan was the richest country right. in the world in right. the 1920s. Amazing. Right. Um, please. Excellent uh, statistics to show Thank a you. very complex economy <laughs> in transition, in rapid transition. So, um, opposite to your path, I emigrated from India to the States, uh, former Wall Street. But uh, I left Wall Street and I'm an entrepreneur now. Fantastic. Um, I would like your your view from as an investor mm. investing actively in, in India about the what we call the two Indias, the India and the Bharat. Uh, while a lot of the statistics apply to the middle class and up, the 350 million odd people, there's also 1.1 billion people that goes to your theme about the less privileged but very hungry, growing mm. fast, but without access to uh, finance without access to basic banking and without access to even affordable um, services. I'm actually building a, a venture that uh, targets those, that, that uh, 1.1 billion people. Primarily, the increase in cash circulation there, despite all the statistics about digitization yeah, in yeah. India, right? Yeah, I'll with you. So what is your view in terms of how you look at the two Indias? What are your investment theses around the mm. 1.1 billion people? Yeah. So look, uh, uh, let me start with the, the financial mm. inclusion piece, right? Um, I think if there's one aspect of that 1.1 billion um, uh, which, has, which has made the greatest amount of progress, that would be the ability of uh, UPI mapped onto bank accounts um, to get, to, to bring the fi former financially excluded people into the system, right? And just for quick background, uh, this is the broad sequence of events is like this. In 2010, the Infosys CEO stepped down and he joined the government and he created UPI or Aadhaar. So Aadhaar, or, uh, uh, Aadhaar is basically all Indians have a card like this. We have a unique ID. So 1.5 billion of these IDs exist, right? This ID in 20, so this was created in 2010. In 2014 and 15, once Modi came to power, he, he got us to map these IDs onto the bank accounts. And in 2014 and 15, around 400 million bank accounts were opened for those who didn't have it. Thus, by the end of 2015, uh, everybody had a bank account and they had a they had this ID mapped onto the bank account. That was a bit controversial because, um, you know, because people said, I don't want my bank account to be mapped onto my ID and you needed a Supreme Court judgment to get on with it. Then in 2016, a conglomerate called Reliance launched broadband, basically free broadband. Effectively, our broadband is free. And that's when the gentleman who would create Aadhaar, Nandan Nilekani, this Infosys CEO, he once again came up with the idea of unified payment interface. So he said, if you have a bank account and you have a unique ID, then he said, why not now get this whole thing onto the mobile phone? So think of a triangle, unique ID, bank account and mobile phone, right? And in India, for all of us, all of us have that triangle. That's why when we go and pay for coffee, I buy the coffee and I just hold up my phone and the, the coffee shop sucks the cash out of my phone effectively out of my bank account. So you've, you got rid of your 
whole, whole credit card, the, the use case for the credit card thus, thus melts away. So, so, so this piece, just to go back to the question, this piece is used by the government to pay subsidies. So before this, subsidies to the poor would be sent to the bank account. Now imagine you are in the middle of nowhere and the bank is 10 kilometers away. You're a low income wage laborer in a field. You have to take a day off from work to go 10 kilometers to a bank to withdraw the subsidy and come back 10 kilometers. And typically the bank, the bank, uh, the bank clerk would know that you're a low income worker and he would extort. He would extort from you part of the subsidy. By putting the subsidy straight into the mobile phone, that whole uh, 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 nexus, that whole uh, uh, rent seeking, the whole rent seeking around poor people's subsidies has been got rid of, right? So we pay roughly $80 billion to the poor. Imagine in the old system, even if, I doubt even if, even, even if half of it was reaching the poor, now the entire amount reaches the poor in the, in the sense it's in their phone and they can then use their phone to pay the, the, guy, the, the, the grocery store in the village through the phone. Right? So the whole need to visit a branch goes away. The banking system is not getting disintimidated. The banking system is still in use. Just the physical need to visit a branch reduces. So that's just to come back. This is the main area where we've been able to pull the poor into the ambit. This is one of the reasons I think uh, the uh, Prime Minister Modi did really well in the 2014 and, 2014 and 19 elections is he understood this better than anybody else very early. Now, the challenge is that as we came, as we as we were discussing jobs for this constituency jobs for this constituency is few and far between so they have broadband and they can watch free movies all day they can watch sports all day um, they can do everything but get a job right and i think that's where that's where uh, i think a new generation of disruptive business models will come up so for example if you see zoho so zoho is a indian software company our hr management software is zoho we use Salesforce for CRM, but if we wanted, we could use Zoho's CRM as well. Uh, they also have account, accounting and payroll software. This software company is based in the villages of South India. This is not in Bangalore. The, the software company's call centers, many of their staffs live in the villages of South India. Right? These sorts of business models, where you go to the villages, you, you tap educated people, but who don't have ready access to urban employment opportunities. I think those, op those, those uh, jobs will come up. The other opportunity, going back to your point on cash is, it's very interesting this, cash as a percentage of GDP, India and America <laughs> lead the world, right? Now America, you could argue that those dollars are being probably used by, you know, mafiosi in various parts of the world. America is printing those dollars, but they're sort of the, the currency of choice for the criminal underworld across the world. Uh, even Japan has high cash to GDP. I don't quite know why. I don't have a ready explanation. But coming back to India, cash to GDP is high. Um, uh, um, it's around 16% uh, around of GDP is cash. Um, so that's around $500 billion. Assume a velocity of two. So that means the $500 billion of cash is financing a billion dollars of GDP, right? Now, the banks in India, fascinatingly, the banks in India have very high loan growth and they are gasping for deposits. The banks want more cash, right? Uh, even though financialization is happening, it's not happening quick enough for the banks to get deposits. So I think there's a ready business opportunity for someone who says, I will take cash from the local tea stall and get it to the bank four times a day. Right. Okay. So that, so then you're on to a winner, I think, uh, because because that piece, right, uh, uh, the velocity at which cash moves into the banking system, I think, can be stepped up, and the banks will pay very good money for that because they they will use that to drive loan growth. With the rise in cashless payments uh, and reliance on overall information uh, IT, uh, what have you seen uh, with regards to cybersecurity? Um, especially for small and medium enterprises, is yeah. that a concern? And um, just, oh, can you talk about your impressions about that? Yeah, so promote that. I think you're probably better placed than me to explain uh, the, 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 the security aspect of the uh, UPI and the Jandanadar. I think you should just get a mic and explain, uh, have we had, a mic uh, can we get a mic over here, please, ma'am? Uh, so, so as far as I know, I'll just introduce Pramod. Pramod is, is a founder of Marcellus. Um, as far as I know, we haven't had massive security breaches. It's obviously something all of us have nightmares about. If this whole ecosystem of unique ID, 
<laughs> bank accounts and mobile phone. If it, if it were to crack, we have nightmares about it. But Pramod, why haven't we had any breaches, any idea? We have. We have had a breach. So uh, Saurabh talked about these new airports having these facial recognition things. Uh, it's a scheme called Digi Yatra. Um, so all of our, I mean, if you want a seamless entry into the airport, you can register yourself, upload your boarding pass. And, and and the system recognizes your faces and you get that entry. It's, that was outsourced to a private company. And about six months ago, we got to know that that database had been breached. So, but the government was very quick to react to that. They literally uh, changed the contract overnight. Um, they forced people or they asked people to sort of delete the app and, and, and upload a new app. So we are prone, given the uh, extent of data that's prevailing in our lives, uh, this was bound to happen. But the, 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 the comforting feature was the uh, quickness with which, uh, which the government reacted to it. Uh, there could be other risks there. Uh, I don't think we can, uh, but the government is aware of that. Um, and as long as we have somebody who's alive and awake to these threats, hopefully, uh, the risk mitigation measures will be in place as well. Yeah. That's the good part. We have we employ the largest base of technology workers in the country, right? So it is it is the global hub of uh, IT. So to that extent, the supply side was in place to be able to seek an alternative <laughs> vendor overnight. So and you know and this is ubiquitous in our lives. For example, when we file taxes, there's no paper anymore. You just you go in online, you file your return. And the return is online. The payment of taxes is online. Um, and and again, you know, when we visit when we visit the Western world, the amount of paper, uh, the, just the, the 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 turnaround times, I, and I suppose that, that happens to every country. The West was built on technology of say 30 years ago. India has got built on the technology of the last 10 years. Whoever develops after us will be even better than us. But uh, this aspect that that as you become more technologically oriented, you become more vulnerable. It's a good question. Uh, so far. We're all right, but uh, but you know you, you just have this feeling of walking on eggshell, eggshells uh, with each passing year. Well, it's it's good to know that uh, here in Japan uh, we have now abolished the floppy disk and uh, you know, <laughs> but the uh, I read you know, about that. It was to, unbelievable. To file for your for your seamless entry into Haneda, I still recommend the fax. Um, <laughs> thank you so much. Um, we've unfortunately run out of time.